Hi, welcome to KFIS or uh, whatever it is. It's called Keep It Fucking Simple. Right, now we're doing a New Year's special treat uh, with some lamb. Hey, so I got this earlier. Uh, the butcher uh, went down to his abattoir and killed this for me. And I chose which bit. I was going to have the whole saddle, but I just have, have a little bit. So, here we have the saddle. Now, as you see, it's still got the type of shiny bit on the outside. But that's great, because I think it keeps all the moisture in. So, to start with, with this, we're going to just open it out beautifully. Now, as we know, this has got a few bones in it which we can feel down in there and up here. Now, so we're going to be taking out the centre bone. So, we start with not having any kettles on in the background. Sorry. Um, right, so we cut it down the centre and then we ease down the spine. Trying to keep most of the meat. And up here we've got a bit of a bone. Now, I would always recommend having a nice sharp knife for this type of thing. So, following the bone here, you can hear the knife scraping against the bone. And when you've got sharp knives, you've also got to be careful not to cut off any type of cartilage because you don't want that in your finished item. So as you can see I'm just scrolling down here and here's a nice little bone. So follow that. So that sticks up there each side. And then we We've got near the end, like that, just keep on cutting away. Right, so you can still feel the cartilage and the bone there, so you just keep following that. And we've got a nice little bit there, let's get underneath that little tendon, always cutting away from yourself. So you don't want to cut yourself as well. Okay, so now we're following this bone. Yes, so. Always helps to give a little bit of pressure and then you feel it give way as you cut. Now, I don't recommend you get your butcher to do this because if you get your butcher to do this, you're not going to learn how to do it yourself. And when you go off on holiday and you decide to cook this in your villa, you won't be able to speak to Alfonso or whoever it is and say, hey, I want this cut up nicely for me. Because he'll wonder what you're on earth you're going on about. Okay, so, now I've got this little bit done. Along here, you can feel tiny ribs. So, what we do is we just find the ends of each one. all the way along. So we get to the end and we've got a, a nice long one which is actually the chop bone and you run your knife close to the chop bone and then you get your knife you get it close to the chop bone and then pull it up and then you cut close to the chop 
like that. Take it out. Right, so with these little ribs here, we want to get the tip of the knife, go down to next next to them. So what we're doing is we're cutting right next to the ribs. Because we want to leave we want to keep the meat in between the ribs. So as you can see this is going nice and easily. But uh, it won't go easily if you're one of those people that think, oh, it doesn't matter if I've got blunt knives. In fact, uh, this knife takes no prisoners. I had a friend of mine called Guy and he was cutting up some uh, sausages for me off the string. And he sliced his hand open. So, see, I'm just prying everything away because I said, tension is your friend. So, then I can get close to these all the way down and start cutting the meat away. Right. And it doesn't matter if you make a bit of a mess of it because you're going to just put it all together anyway. Now, as I said, tension is your friend and you're trying to keep it nice and close to that nice backbone, right, and peel it away. Now, you've got a tailbone in here as well, which also helps you guide as to where you are. And we're going to start slicing away. near that tailbone. Now ideally what we don't want to happen is to go all the way through our piece of back meat. So as we go along here so we can see it's still nicely stuck there. So what we're doing is cutting and you see it comes apart beautifully beautifully. So see how it, it's it's really starting to sh take shape now isn't it? So we're just slicing down there. Right so that's one side done. So we're going to stop filming and I'm going to do the other side and then I'll rejoin you. We're rocking. Okay so now we've got most of it disentangled from the bone. Not all of it, but most of it. So uh, what I'm doing now is just getting closer to that backbone. Now bearing in mind we want to try and keep this as one piece. So what I do now is I get the backbone and I cut close using the own weight of the meat to pull it away from the backbone. Trying not to get any cartilage in because that isn't what we want. So we're going down. We might have to skim over this to find little bits of cartilage. And that's what I said. We use the weight. Okay. So now we've got our piece of lamb, and what we do is we get it up and we're going to skim over just where we cut and feel for any bits of cartilage because you don't want someone tucking into their nice piece of lamb and finding a nasty piece of bloody cartilage, do we? Some of this cartilage runs quite close to the skin, so be careful. Right, so, got that. 
and we're just going to pause the video for a minute season it a bit of coarsely ground black pepper now bearing in mind I'm going to be sous videing this so I don't want to over season it because uh, it's not good and here I'm putting on some Hawaiian salt not much and we're going for a little bit of white pepper do it from a great height and hopefully it won't go all in one place Whoa. Boom, boom. Right, okay, so now we're going to uh, put in a little bit of mustard. And as you can see, I've carefully smoothed it out with the back of a spoon. And the thing is with a lot of these things, you don't have to get it completely all in the same place because when people are eating it, sometimes it's nice they, to, they're eating it away and then suddenly go, oh, there's a bit of extra mustard. It gives it a bit of lift. So then we've got some uh, red currant jelly with port, which I made earlier. Um, and if you can't make it yourself, then you're a lazy bastard. Um, it's very easy to make and it's so much nicer than getting the shop ones. So you just double splodge it everywhere and as you can see I'm doing a fine job of this and yeah that'll do me. Voila! So now we come to the string. Now I worked in a butcher's for a few years so I could learn how to do butchery and how to tie joints like this. And I'm still bloody rubbish at it. So we put in these lovely wings, right? And then we pause the video for the telephone. Right now, as you can see, this looks really gorgeous and tough and yucky. So we put in some herbs and you carefully place them and then roll that up, roll that up and you think, oh, oh, that looks, that looks quite nice, that does. Yeah, you can imagine the little lamb strolling around with a back like that. Beautiful. And so we get the string and we get it like that, we pull it up and uh, I just try a knot because that's good enough. Um, because I don't actually need to really, really, really pull this lamb together. Uh, this is just to hold it basically roughly in place. Um, so I don't need a tension knot where I'm pulling hard to get it to do exactly what I want. So, also, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm not very good at bloody tying them. So I'd make myself look a right idiot, wouldn't I? Uh, I mean, I can do them. It's just a little bit of a, a faff. There we go, just for you. So, and now we're getting close to the neck. And try and keep the string away from the meat because you're going to be using it another time. But uh, you might think, oh, I'm just going to be using it for roasting, so it doesn't really matter the wrong. Sometimes you're going to be using it for times when you're not roasting. I do actually keep two separate pieces of string, one for dishes that I'm not going to be roasting because it's cheap enough down at the butcher, not the butchers, well the butchers sundry suppliers. Um, so yeah, that looks good enough to me. Right, okay, we're going to get on to the next stage in a second. So thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you off in a second.
broken. Hi, right, okay, we're back. Now, as I said, I was going to sous vide this uh, baby. So, I made an extra long bag, and you might say, oh, why is it such a long bag? It's just that when I vacuum pack things like this, you tend to get juices flowing up towards the vacuum bit. And at the end of the day, when you sous vide something, you've got to seal it a little bit extra for when you have juices in. So I'm putting it into my rather noisy, as you'll soon find out, machine. Um, and I'm going to be sealing this twice. So I'll just do a normal one first. And as you can see, it's sucking up. Now, because this weighs quite a bit, I always push it towards the sous vide so it's not trying to pull itself towards the sous vide. So now you see it's pulling up really nicely and we're getting a few juices come through there and yes, they're running towards the front um, and that's going to uh, compromise the seal a little bit. But as I said, again, I'm going to actually seal it twice. So, uh, right, and it's sealing up. Hey! So, undo that. Right, pull that back just a fraction. Close it up again. Press wet seal and start. Hey! Right, okay, we're all done. So, what I do is I unplug this vacuum packer, hold this up to the light and really check that seal has gone all the way along. And it seems to have. So get rid of this, throw that away. Well, don't throw it away, but you know, throw it to one side. Throw that to one side. Get my dirty tea towel, put it down there. Get rid of these potatoes. Put this chopping board up by the sink and I get my cool box. You see why the hell's he got a cool box? It's because it's insulated and it keeps it nice and warm. So it's not using too much electricity. So then what I do is I'm going to be cooking this to 54 degrees. Now I've set the temperature on my tap to 55 degrees. So, uh, I just turn it on, and obviously some cold water is going in initially, and then I just get some uh, balls. Uh, now, you're saying balls, why does he want some balls? Right, the reason I want these balls is because you get surface evaporation from your sous vide. So you get these balls, chuck them in. And as you can see, loads of little balls. Bloody brilliant they are. So it really cuts down on the evaporation there, which is exactly what we want. So, look. So, sous vide temperature, 54.5 degrees is medium rare on the rare-ish side. Now, I'm going to do it to 50 five and a half. Just a little bit more because I think lamb's a bit nice and it's done a little bit more. Well actually I think I'll do it to 56 today. So I'm doing it to 56 but do bear in mind that you're going to be searing this joint afterwards so you're going to be introducing a little bit more heat but that shouldn't matter too much. So uh, we're just going to fill this up, set this to, I said 56 didn't I? Yes. Well, it's going to take a while to fill up so we're going to switch the camera off and I'll catch you up in a minute. Right okay so now we've got a couple of important things I've got to mention here. Now, wine. Absolutely bloody lovely. But there has been a few occasions where I've been cooking and I've been downing this and I've been downing this. And uh, one particular occasion I had a full size Mau Mau. And uh, I fell asleep. Nobody could wake me because I was actually pie eyed. So um, it, I had to, my, my guests cooked it. And I woke up some hours later and they said we saved you some. So, in other words, best to give this to the cameraman. Thank you, David.
Cheers, fella. Right, okay, so we've actually, actually set it to 55.5, uh, and I'm going to plonk it in there, and I've decided on three and a half hours. So the time now is roughly half past one, so three and a half is uh, half, no, it, it, it's uh, five o'clock. Five o'clock. Oh, and I haven't even been drinking. Five o'clock. Okay, so I'll write this down, 5 p.m., lamb out. Okay, so now I've got a baseline to work on everything else that I'm going to accompany it with. Bearing in mind that I've got to preheat the grill beforehand because I'm going to brown it on the outside, or I might just actually fry it in a nice frying pan. So, let's see how it goes. Hi, right, okay, now this has been in the sous vide, as we know. So what I do is I cut off the, the top, like this. Whoa! And then I've got some real gravy over here, and I'm ready to just get any juices into there. Okay, so now I've got my sous vide lamb, and I get my little tweezers. And as you can see over here, these brussels I cooked in the oven at first on a really high heat of 220 and here I'm just glazing them off in a little bit of butter, a tiny bit of oil, and a little bit of sugar, just glazing them off. But as they've been roasted at a really high temperature, they will be delish. So here you can see I'm just putting a little bit of colour on it. And give my gravy a stir. I think that will be it. I'm going to put it on the chopping board now. Well, actually, I can bring the chopping board over here because there's a nice lot of light here. So. Now oh, that might be too hot for the chopping board. It might melt it. How hot's that? Oh, that's quite hot. So uh, I'll put this over here. And let's get this lamb on there. So, let's see what it looks like. So. How's that look? Bloody delicious. And sometimes it's quite nice just to finish off each side because not everybody likes it quite so pink. I think it could have been done at maybe a few degrees more, but that's not a problem because I'm just trying to get some extra space here. So let's cut another one. So look at that, absolutely beautiful. That is absolutely glorious. Okay, well thank you very much for watching.